Hello everyone. When looking at the question of why certain countries are rich, researchers sometimes introduce the mythical institutions of democracy and respect for private property. You see, it is institutions and respect that are the reason why some countries are rich and others are poor. Today we will not explain why rich and poor countries arise, we will look at one particular country's path to wealth and prosperity. But before we get started subscribe to our channel, give us a like and post the video on social media. Next I will tell you why America is so rich and the rest of the world is just jealous of us. The United States gained its independence during the famous American Revolution of 1765-1783. At that time, the states were not rich in natural resources, and they had no industry. Strictly speaking, America had two allies cotton and slaves. And with these two allies, the US was entering the industrial age. The mechanism of American industrialization is extremely simple. Our climate is suitable for growing cotton, which is very valuable in the West. There are huge numbers of slaves in Africa, which Europeans are eager to bring to us to sell. By selling cotton, the cost of which is due solely to the slaves' rations, we get money with which we buy machines and build an industrialized nation. Most of the industry was built in the North, with the lion's share of the revenue coming from the southern states. The South was turning into a de facto raw material colony of the North. 80% of tax payments to the budget came from the South, two-thirds of southern cotton was exported. At the same time, the northern states were not satisfied with the fact that the South wanted its own industry and bought machines in Great Britain for this purpose. Huge duties were imposed on the importation of looms, and as a result the southern states had to buy them in the North, where they were more expensive and of lower quality than in England. And the North controlled the entire merchant marine and banking system. The states created jobs in the North, where they tried to build industry, where huge numbers of emigrants fled, for example from Ireland where the worst famines raged. This was the cause of the Civil War, in which the North asserted its right to dominate the South, already an industrialized country. When we talk about the South and industrialization, we are of course talking about slave labor. Slaves were the key to the accumulation of original capital. That being said, the states were very lucky with their neighbors. To the West were vast expanses of land, sparsely populated by Indians and suitable for development. To the south was the crumbling Spanish colonial empire, and to the north were the French colonies, which France could not hold in the face of Britain's maritime dominance. So, the US was adding territories to itself without brutal and bloody wars. France and Spain were happy to sell territories to the states for symbolic sums, and the newly formed Mexico had no chance to defend itself against the aggression of the states. But in the future, these lands would be found first for gold and then for oil, which would greatly enrich the United States. At the same time, the new territories in the West allowed to avoid the social collapse that most European countries faced. Whereas in Europe industrial workers were forced to unionize and fight for their rights, in America they could always just go West and become farmers. Thus, the US avoided not only bloody wars, but also the social upheavals that were characteristic of European countries. All this conditioned the absolute dominance of the US over both Americas, no one could threaten its interests in these territories. The US forbade the European powers to interfere in any way in the internal affairs of the American countries. In both world wars, which brought great destruction to the countries of Europe, the US could not have entered at all, but it did so to increase its profits and confirm its status as a world power. The fact is that in the First World War America actively helped the Entente countries with loans and was not interested in their collapse. Now for those details that show how the US was taking over the world. In 1913 America had a negative balance of trade and its investment in other countries, mainly Latin American economies, was less than its foreign public debt. While at the end of 1913 there were 2.065 billion then dollars worth of US capital abroad, the United States itself owed $5 billion. It should be noted that these were $1,873, each of which at that time was equivalent to 1.50463 grams of pure gold. However, with the outbreak of the First World War, the picture changed. From August 1, 1914 to January 1, 1917, the Americans loaned $1,900,000,000 to the warring countries. Already in April 1915, Thomas Lamont, one of the co-owners of the Morgan Financial Empire, speaking to journalists, 
said that America needed to help the European allies as much as possible, as this would lead to the Americans buying back their debt obligations to France and England. Even more Americans placed loans after the US entered the war. By the end of the war, they totaled $10 billion $85 million. Of this, about $7 billion went to purchase arms and war materials from the Americans themselves. As a result, America went from being one of the largest debtors to the largest creditor. France and England, on the contrary, turned from the world's largest creditors into the world's largest debtors. In the case of France, this was due to the fact that the country was engaged in hostilities, and its northeastern part, where most of the heavy industry was concentrated, was under German occupation throughout the war. France's own gold reserves at the beginning of the war were estimated at $845 million, and it is not surprising that all of them were spent during the first months of the war. As for England, the matter was that in informal conversations American statesmen throughout the war and the first post-war years assured their British partners that at the end of the war America would partially cancel the debts of these countries and partially shift the burden of their payments on the shoulders of the defeated powers, linking the schedule of repayment of debts of the borrowing countries with the schedule of reparation payments from the central powers. Thunder rumbled on March 4, 1920. On that day the British received a reply from the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury to a message from their Secretary of the Treasury sent on February 20th of the same year. The reply read roughly as follows. If you continue to be late in paying interest, you will not receive another dollar from us. We do not care that Germany does not pay you. You got colonies in Africa from her, the French got back Alsace and Lorraine, but we also fought and did not acquire any territories. So be kind enough to pay what is due including the interest due to us. Thus, it might seem that reparation payments would have fully covered the first 10 years of interest on the debts. Only after 1933 would the British have to pay $161 million a year, which would exceed the reparation receipts by only 11 and a bit million. Already in 1923, however, not a fennig was received from Germany. France got out of the situation by jointly occupying the Ruhr with Belgium. The two countries had theirs. And what was the British to do? The British convened the London Conference, which on August 16, 1924 approved a reparation plan for Germany, developed by an international committee of experts under the chairmanship of American banker Charles Gates Dawes. The plan provided for a loan of $200 million to Germany, including $110 million from American banks, to stabilize the mark, set the size of payments to Germany for the first five years at 1.75 billion marks per year and then at 2.5 billion marks per year. 1 billion gold marks was then approximately $238 million. That same 23.04% for England in monetary terms would be $54,835,000, which was 36.6% .6 of the amount the British had to pay the Americans. The other 95 million England had to pay out of their own taxpayers' pockets. Even out of the 1.75 million marks that Germany would have had to pay in 1929, England would have gotten only $96 million. But even these underestimated amounts Germany paid irregularly, and by the early 1930s had stopped paying again. To settle the payments, the Hague Reparations Conference of 1929-30 produced a second reparations plan for Germany, replacing the Dawes Plan. This plan was called the Jung Plan after the name of its drafter. This plan provided for a new reduction of reparation payments. This plan was only implemented for one year. In World War II, American industry was able to get out of the Great Depression because of war orders. The world is on fire, I am on horseback was the slogan of the United States of that period. After World War II, the United States was left with two problems, communism and communists. The ideas of equality, social justice and other socialism stirred the minds of ordinary Americans. Besides, this contagion was spreading all over the world and the US set itself the task of fighting it by interfering in the internal affairs of one country or another. And if the US lost in Vietnam, having felt the futility of such a massacre, after that they suddenly realized that it was possible to invade other countries not to fight against a hateful ideology, but for the sake of resources. But it is somehow ugly to invade the affairs of sovereign countries for the sake of resources, so every time it was necessary to find convenient pretexts. Fortunately for the US, the oil boom in the Middle East and North Africa fell at a time when the local states could not be called democratic. Thus, the US strung the ideals of democracy across the Middle East, 
while gaining monopolies on oil production in certain regions. At the moment, the USA is the only superpower in the world capable of controlling such a huge amount of resources outside its own country. At the same time, the internal resources of the US itself, together with its powerful industry, are enough to remain the richest country, but it is not enough for a superpower. Throughout its existence, there have been no direct threats to the economic well-being or sovereignty of the United States. Colonial wars were easy and victorious for the states, and the development of territories in the West was also easy. The First World War, even in case of the Entente's defeat, which was unlikely, did not promise the states serious losses. And Japan in World War II never wanted to conquer the US, but only wanted to kick them out of their region. At the same time, American aid in Europe only guaranteed them political control of those territories after the war. Guys, if you liked our video, but you haven't subscribed to us yet, subscribe right now and post the video in social networks, there will be a lot of interesting things in the next episodes. See you soon. Bye.